I'm Rick Morin, uh, Dean of the College of Medicine here, and I'd like to welcome you all to our house. Uh, and I w I'm really pleased to say <laughs> our absolutely packed house tonight. It's a wonderful to see, see the turnout uh, of the university and the community uh, for, this, for this event. That you, we have people in other, in other rooms look at, watching as well. Uh, and we're going to get a lot of pictures of this crowd because we're going we're gonna to raise an endowment for, to have this an endowed uh, <laughs> lectureship in the future. Uh, the, um, and uh, so I'm, I'm just really thrilled to see, uh, to see the, the attendance. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really important uh, issue, set of issues we're talking about tonight. And uh, we, uh, we want to make this a, a we, this is an annual event. We want it to look like this annually. <laughs> uh, and uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Margaret to do some introductions. Good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you. Wow, thank you all. We are a little overwhelmed, <laughs> can you say? But we really appreciate you uh, turning out for the fifth annual MLK Health Equity Lecture. We're pleased tonight to have Professor uh, Dorothy uh, Roberts as our uh, guest speaker for um, this um, um, lecture. The MLK Lecture was actually created in 2014 with the help of Dean Warren, and we really, um, our vision for this lecture is to really engage our community and um, inspire us in, into campus dialogue and really talking about community engagement and uh, civic education around topics of race and how it actually, how it um, relates to health disparities. So with the help of uh, Dean Warren, we've been um, able to grow this, this um, lecture incredibly. This is our largest crowd by far. Um, today, and we hope it will um, continue. Um, Dorothy Roberts is a JD. She is the um, 14th Penn, Penn Integrates um, Knowledge Professor at the U U University of Pennsylvania. She also holds the inaugural Raymond Pace and Sadie Tanner Marshall Alexander Chair. She is the founding um, Director of Penn Program on Race, Science, and um, Society in the Center of um, Africana uh, Studies. She is the author of more than 100 scholarly articles and uh, book chapters. And actually, at the end of the talk, she will be um, uh, doing a uh, <coughs> book signing um, featuring three, um, three of her uh, books, Shadow Bonds, Killing the uh, Black Body and How Science and Politics and Big Business Recreate Race in the uh, 21st Century. She serves on the board of directors of the American Academy of Political Science, uh, Political and um, Social Science, and she has she she has been supported by the American Council of Learned Societies, the National Science F Foundation, the Robert Wood. Johnson Foundation, Harvard Program on Ethics and uh, Professions, and uh, Stanford <coughs> Center for Comparative Studies in Race and um, Ethnicity. Um, she also has done a, uh, a uh, TED Med talk in 2015 entitled The uh, Problem with Race-Based um, Medicine. And I would encourage all of you to actually um, t take a look at that. And, uh, it's had o over one million views. So it is my distinct pleasure to really wo welcome Professor um, Roberts to our um, um, UVM um, community here this evening. So w welcome, Dorothy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dean Morin and Dr. Tando and Tiffany Delaney also for uh, welcoming me here and for those introductions. I'm really pleased that so many people came to hear this talk and I hope it does get you some funding for the program. <laughs> Anything I can do to help. <laughs> so um, there was some advertising for 
this program where I saw a quote by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. where he identified as the most shocking and inhumane form of inequality, inequality in health care. And I believe Dr. King was probably talking about the huge, uh, shameful racial gaps in health in the United States. Uh, we know that the gaps just between blacks and whites in terms of mortality, in terms of survival from breast cancer, hypertension, other forms of heart disease, infant mortality, maternal mortality, and I could go on and on and on, are shocking and inhumane. I think Dr. King may also have been talking about the way in which healthcare shows who is valued in society, who has access to health care, who lives and dies, whose life is made harder because of lack of access to health care, uh, tells us something about the society as well as the people who are suffering from various illnesses and poor health. Uh, and underlying that, I think King may have been referring to the way in which the very concept of race has affected people's health in America. And that's what I want to focus on in my talk today. So let me begin with one of those shocking and inhumane disparities in health. Uh, in 2007, Dr. Steve Whitman appeared in this story in Chicago <coughs> Magazine about the higher breast cancer death rate among black women in Chicago compared to white women in Chicago. Uh, what he and his team of researchers found was that even though in Chicago black women are slightly less likely to get breast cancer, they're twice as likely as white women to die from breast cancer. And just as shocking was another finding uh, that's displayed in the chart he's holding here. And that was that in 1980, black and white women in Chicago died from breast cancer at exactly the same rate. And then what happened was the gap emerged around uh, 2000 or so, or 20, by 20 years later, 25 years later, the death rate for black women was twice as much as white women. But not because black women's health got worse. Uh, their death rate stayed the same over those 25 years. What happened was white women's survival doubled, or their death rate was cut in half. And Dr. Whitman said to me when I interviewed him, that shows that there were great advances in breast cancer detection and treatment over those 20 years, and black women got absolutely no advantage from it. That was his interpretation. Now, these disparities in health continue to be at the forefront of scientific and policy debates in the United States. Uh, as we speak, Congress is debating whether or not to cut Medicaid and other services to the poor, medical services to the poor, and whether to allow states to add work requirements to Medicaid. Uh, taking, should we take the position that health care is a human right, or is it a privilege for the wealthy? And if you can't afford it, uh, it's all right for the government to put restrictions to make it harder for you to get it. Uh, actually, Trump, the Trump administration has allowed states, Kentucky has already applied and for uh, the work requirement, and the Trump administration has go, gone ahead without Congress deciding whether or not to do it to allow states to put those restrictions on. Uh, in the scientific community, there continues to be a debate about why there are these persistent 
racial gaps in health, with some people arguing or looking for some innate predisposition to disease that explains it, you know, racial differences in predisposition to disease, or whether the, these gaps are caused by different social conditions. And the idea, despite evidence like this, that it's most likely that gaps in health come from social conditions and not from innate differences, there is still embedded in a lot of scientific research on health and in the practice of medicine itself the notion that people of different races have different predispositions to disease because of their race, and that explains the gaps. In fact, the idea that human beings are divided into separate races, and that's what explains differences in their health, biological predispositions, is embedded in medical practice. Uh, let me point out just one example that when I saw this, I was shocked. I couldn't believe that this was part of medical practice. Uh, this is the results of a blood test, and uh, one of the most important parts of the blood test is the glomerular filtration rate, uh, which is an important indicator of kidney function. And doctors use this to determine whether or not a patient is at risk of kidney failure and needs to get some follow-up. And you'll see here, I think probably the doctors in the room might uh, have seen this lots of times, that uh, the results come out with one number, one estimate for non-African Americans and another estimate for African American patients, just automatically. Doesn't matter what the African American patient is like, anything about them other than their race, or what the non-African American patients are like. All that matters is the racial identification of the patient. And then, I mean, I want to make it clear for those of you who don't practice medicine, that this is not because there's some other concentration of this protein in the blood in African Americans, you know, in this patient who happened to be African American or, or left because it happened to be uh, non-African American. It's the, it's the same patient. It's one patient. The patient has a particular concentration of a protein in the blood, but if the patient is black, it's read differently than if the patient is white. And if you look at what the different numbers mean, here you'll see that the higher the number, the uh, more likely the doctor will think it's normal, and the lower the number, the more at risk the patient will seem. So this means, now these are pretty you know, n normal numbers, but imagine if they were somewhat lower, you could see that for the African-American patient, the doctor is going to be less concerned. The same amount of protein in the blood than for the uh, non-African-American patient. Now, I, I just think this is incredible. I saw that and said, what did it can possibly be that if I go into a doctor, the doctor is going to tell me one reading just because I'm black when I have the exact same amount of protein the same indicator is a non-African American patient. Never mind how the doctor, how I would be identified and all the problems with that, you know, just the fact that this could happen. And I did some investigation and said, why, why would you possibly have a test like this? And I was told, well, it's based on the assumption that African Americans have more muscle mass than other human beings. 
It doesn't matter what the patient's muscle mass is. <laughs> There's just, you see, no, and you laugh, right? It seems ridiculous. But this is how, this is how this blood test is read routinely, routinely. And why do we have something in medical practice that would elicit laughter? And it's absurd. And yet it's common medical practice. And this isn't the only example. It happens to be one my daughter said, Mommy, can you believe this when she got her blood test at UCLA Hospital? Uh, but I'm, there's lots of other examples. Uh, now, where does this idea come from that doctors should treat people of one race categorically differently than people of other races? Well, it comes from the very concept of race, of course. Uh, we have to go back to the idea that human beings are divided into these large groups where everybody within the group is supposed to have common characteristics that are different from people in other groups. And uh, we call those groups races. Uh, and they're supposed to be biologically distinct from each other. Now that is a concept that was invented. The very idea that human beings should be divided into five groups, let's say. You know, that's made up. Why should we divide human beings into that number of groups? You could go to the continent of Africa and divide Africa up into a thousand populations if you wanted to. So where did this come from? Well, Historians of science have traced it to the late 16th century, uh, into the 17th century, uh, really crystallized in the 19th century. But the idea was that in order to justify, for Europeans to justify, going to other people's lands, conquering them, enslaving them, exterminating them, taking their property and their land, they had to invent first the concept that people were divided into races with some of those races being less intelligent, less civilized, less attractive, less moral than they were, uh, especially, especially when they decided that they wanted to enslave Africans who converted to Christianity. Then they had to explain, how are you going to enslave a human being who is a Christian? So then it became imperative to say, this, these are people who are a different type of human being. They're closer to animals than to us. And for political reasons, they divided all human beings, all human beings into these categories uh, and put them into a hierarchy with Europeans at the top and Africans at the bottom and other groups in between. And these were scientists, typologists, who had, were dividing up all of the universe, all living things and non-living things into different categories, and they included human beings into those typologies. And medicine became an important way of promoting this view, uh, promoting the view that human beings were divided into biologically distinct races because the idea that people of different races have different diseases and experience common diseases differently, it's a big, powerful way of supporting the idea that they're biologically distinct. That's a, a biological explanation of different human difference rooted in differences in disease and experience of disease. And 
ideologically was helpful, uh, you know, a helpful way of reinforcing the view that races are biologically distinct and that they exist in nature. They weren't invented. Uh, th this is happening at a time when science is moving away from religious views of human creation, but they actually incorporate a very religious creationist view that uh, either God created races this way or evolution created <laughs> races this way. And it's the exact same concept that human beings are naturally divided, that this apolitical view of how races occur, not from politics, but from nature. Uh, Thomas Jefferson held that view. He observed biological differences between the races, and then he used those observations to explain why black people could not participate as equals to white people in America. Even if they were emancipated, uh, they would never be capable of participating in a democracy. And he justified this political view by referring to the biological distinctions that uh, nature has made. Not slaveholders didn't make these distinctions. Nature made the distinctions. The incorporation of these ideas into medicine became a very powerful way of justifying slavery in the United States. Uh, the idea that enslaving African people was good for medical reasons, it was beneficial to black people, was a very powerful justification for slavery. Uh, that, that's one of the reasons why it's so helpful to have scientists, especially medical scientists, support the biological concept of race because it's so convincing when they say this is for the patient's good. That's more convincing than if a politician says it <laughs> because we believe that scientists are investigating nature, you know, the way things naturally are. And we believe that the medical profession is working for the benefit of patients. Uh, so we might be suspicious if a politician gave this explanation, but it works better when doctors give it. So Dr. Samuel Cartwright, who was educated, trained at the University of Pennsylvania, was a very compelling promoter of slavery with his argument that slavery was good for black people's health. And he was a, an expert, the leading expert on Negro medicine. And his main argument was that black people had lower lung capacity and so they had to be forced to work to be healthy. Uh, he also identified drapetomania as a disease that he said explained why some blacks would flee plantations. It was a mental disorder <laughs> that caused them to do that because if you were healthier as a slave, then you must have some mental disorder that would cause you to want to leave a condition it, that was good for you. And he wrote in a medical journal that it is the red vital blood sent to the brain that liberates their minds when under the white man's control, and it is the want of sufficiency of red vital blood that chains their minds to ignorance and barbarism when in freedom. Look at how compelling that is that you could argue that slavery equals freedom and freedom equals barbarism and being chained to ignorance. But be again, because he relied on his supposed neutral medical observations and his diagnoses and prescriptions that were good for African people, 
it was an especially compelling way to justify slavery. There was also an aspect of the connection between biological race and slavery that made black women especially vulnerable to experimentation and negative stereotypes about them. Uh, black women were valuable not only for their production in the fields or in the households of slaveholders, they were also valuable for their reproductive labor. And so there was a, an effort to control their childbearing, uh, and not only to control their childbearing, but to define the children of black women as black human beings who could be enslaved. So one of the very first laws passed in the U.S. colony, well, it wasn't U.S., the American colonies, even prior to the, the United States existing, was a law that stated what is the race of a black woman, black woman's child, who is fathered by, and they use the word Englishmen, because these were still Englishmen in the 1600s in the colony of Virginia. And there's a preamble to this law that says, whereas there's a question as to what is the status of these children. And this is one of the clearest ways that we can see race being invented for political reasons. Because at that time, you could have easily said, and probably the more natural thing to say would be that the race of the father, and natural by natural I mean following British tradition, that children inherit the status of their fathers, right? But if that were the case, then all these babies being born to black women, fathered by white slaveholders, would have been white. Now, of course, we could imagine that. Well, it's hard for some people to imagine it. Like, some people can't imagine that. They can't imagine that a child born to a black woman would be white. In fact, when that happens, I'm, I'm working on an article now with one of my grad students. When that happens, it makes headlines. White, mo black mother gives birth to white baby. Have you seen this? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's almost like, it gives birth to alien. You know, it's like, it's not, that cannot possibly happen. I mean, why do we think that can't possibly happen? Only because of the way we've defined race in the United States, right? So um, it, it created, though, a idea about race that children inherit the race of black children, inherit the race of their mothers, that, the, that reproduction has produced the status of these children. Uh, not, again, not the law, which actually was what produced the status of these children, but it's the reproduction of black women, their childbearing. And that idea that black women's childbearing produces the disadvantaged status of their children, that's another lecture, but that has been a powerful way of thinking about black women in America and the causes of social problems. I mean, just think of all the social problems that have been attributed to black women's childbearing and all the efforts uh, well, I'm going to skip ahead one, like this, uh, the, U the North Carolina Eugenics Board that was compelling the sterilization of black women uh, on welfare until the 1970s, <coughs> uh, but it also, during the time of slavery, allowed for brutal medical experiments on enslaved women, of course, without their consent, they were incapable of giving consent because they were considered property, uh, but um, also without anesthesia. So uh, in, uh, it was two, about 2004, Sally Satel wrote this uh, cover story article for the New York Times Magazine, I am a racially profiling doctor, illness isn't colorblind, so why is it taboo 
for doctors to note a patient's race. Uh, now, anyone here knows that it's not taboo <laughs> for doctors to note a patient's race. Doctors note patient's race all the time, and in most medic medical schools, Students are taught to note a patient's race. But she wanted to be a little cantankerous about this question. But in the article, she gives all these examples of why it's better to prescribe medication by race. And she points out that she prescribes uh, certain psychotropic drugs at different doses depending on the patient's race. And she also points out that uh, anesthesiologists use drying agents when they're going to intubate black patients because black people salivate more than people of other races. Uh, because I was following her work, I happened to note a couple of years later, she issues this erratum saying that she's actually been told that there isn't a common knowledge that black people salivate more than people of other races. Uh, but she says, there are many other intrinsic differences, so that doesn't undercut the overall uh, message of her uh, article. One of the ways, like glomerular filtration rate, that doctors use race is when it's embedded in the very technology that's used. Uh, and I think this barometer is a fascinating example because we can trace its use directly back to Samuel Cartwright in the South in the 1800s. He did not invent it, but he helped to perfect it in order to uh, incorporate racial differences in lung capacity. And there are still today some spirometers that have a button for race so that the machine spits out a reading that corrects for the patient's race. Again, incorporating categorically the idea that black people as a race are different from all other human beings. Again, regardless of the patient's individual characteristics, the patient's symptoms, the patient's family history, the patient's complaints, uh, the chest x-ray, you know, all the things that might indicate to a doctor that's overcome by this categorical treatment in, in this case. Another example of the problem <laughs> with using race categorically uh, in medicine is that sometimes it leads to a misdiagnosis. Uh, Richard Garcia wrote this well-known case now in pediatrics about a childhood friend of his who, when she was young, had multiple visits to the emergency room because of lung problems <coughs> where the doctors could not figure out what was wrong with her and why uh, she wasn't responding to treatment, and it was only when she was eight and someone looked at her chest x-ray without knowing her race and said immediately, who's the kid with cystic fibrosis? And it was only then, after years of doctors examining her, that it, she was diagnosed with cystic fibrosis because there was an assumption that she couldn't possibly have cystic fibrosis because that's a white disease and she's black. Probably, to me, the most horrifying example of how race affects doctors' diagnoses and treatment in a harmful way is the undertreatment of black people for pain. Uh, there have been, for a while, a number of studies that show that black patients receive less pain medication than whites for the same injuries. Uh, this one uh, by uh, Clear Todd and others found that blacks receive uh, no pain medication for long bone fractures at twice the rate as white patients. And uh, this team 
made an effort to look for injuries that we know are painful. So it would be hard for the doctor not to realize that the patient was in pain. And they also looked at the medical chart to see that these were patients who did say they were in pain. Because there's, all, there's also uh, this idea that black people don't express their pain, that it's part of black culture coming out of slavery, I suppose, to be hardy and uh, work hard and, and not um, well, not necessarily work hard, because there's another stereotype that says black people don't work hard. But uh, to put up a, you know, a, a, a stone face and uh, endure pain. I mean, that does come from slavery. The idea that it, Thomas Jefferson has this in his notes on the state of Virginia, that black people just don't feel pain. And so it's easier to oppress somebody who doesn't feel pain. Um, there's also the stereotype that black people exaggerate their pain. Uh, and so I've heard from a number of nurses that they were told that if a black person expresses a certain amount of pain, you reduce it uh, because they're probably exaggerating their pain. And so it could be that uh, even though these patients expressed pain, the uh, medical staff downgraded it uh, thinking that this person is just making it up. But those excuses don't really apply when you have little kids screaming in pain with appendicitis. And uh, they're, 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 they haven't learned yet the stereotype that they're supposed to not express their pain. And we know they, they're diagnosed with appendicitis, so we know they're in pain. And they don't hide their pain. Uh, and this study looked at children in severe pain. And they were far less likely to be given opioid analgesia than white children. Now, this probably is based on the stereotype that black people are naturally predisposed to drug addiction. Uh, and uh, therefore, you don't want to uh, give a child addicting medication because they might, a black child, they're much more comfortable giving it to a white child. And just as an aside, uh, there's good evidence that this stereotype that black people are predisposed to addiction and white people are somehow immune to addiction ha uh, helped to create the opioid crisis because production of opioid painkillers was fueled in part by stereotypes that white people would not be become addicted to it. Uh, you can look at this evidence now, documents that show how it was being marketed to doctors and also uh, doctors' willingness to even overprescribe it to white patients. Uh, perhaps based on this false belief. Now, uh, is it based on stereotypes? Well, a recent study out of University of Virginia Medical School found a significant association between medical students and residents who believed false ideas about biological differences between blacks and whites that included black people have thicker skin than white people and therefore don't feel pain and black people have less sensitive nerve endings than white people and therefore don't feel as much pain and they found a significant association between those beliefs and the undertreatment of black people for pain. In 2000, Bill Clinton and Francis Collins, now head of NIH, announced the mapping of the human genome. And they made a point to say that it showed that race does not exist at the genetic level. 
uh, Bill Clinton said, in genetic terms, all human beings, regardless of race, are more than 99.9 percent .9 the same. Actually, isn't the most helpful way to just say it, <laughs> because of course you'll say, oh, but that 0.1 percent, <laughs> that's what race is, you know. And, but he should have added that that 0.1 percent is actually made up of differences between people within population. You know, let's not forget that people within even the groups we identify as races are not identical to each other. <laughs> There's a lot of genetic variation. As I said, just on the continent of Africa alone, there's more genetic variation than all of the rest of, hum of uh, humanity, just on the continent of Africa. So uh, this does not mean that uh, the little bit of, you know, it's still lots of genes, is divided into race. No, it cannot be divided into racial boxes. And so many people thought, okay, here's the signal now to scientists, genomic scientists, biomedical researchers, uh, people in the medical profession to figure out another way to understand disease, understand health inequities, understand the best way to treat patients without relying on false concepts of biological race. Uh, but in fact, what happened was that many <coughs> genomic scientists and biomedical researchers began looking for, using the data coming out of the Human Genome Project to do just the opposite, to look for genetic differences between human races. And Nicholas Wade, who wrote in the New York Times, was very fond of uh, publishing articles about the latest study that showed that, yes, the human beings really are divided naturally into races, and this is how we are going to address racial gaps in health, by learning more about these genetic differences. Uh, in um, my book, Fatal Invention, How Science, Politics, and Big Business Recreate Race in the 21st Century, I document this increase in interest in defining race as a genetic grouping, uh, how those genetic explanations for racial inequities uh, help to explain for many people why we still have racial gaps in a supposedly post-racial society. Uh, if, if we're supposed to be post-racial, but we still see that people of different races fare differently in this country in terms of incarceration, arrests, uh, high school graduation, admission to college, income, wealth, I could go on and on, and health, go on and on and on. How do you explain it? <coughs> and for Many people, the explanation is, it's just natural. These gaps are natural. Unfortunately, the races evolved separately, and some are predisposed to all these bad things. And black people are the most predisposed. For some reason, uh, that group turned out to be naturally predisposed to all these negative outcomes. Uh, of course, in the research, you know, there are positive outcomes, too, but the research tends to focus on the negative outcomes. I, you know, I'm, I'm always looking for that genetic explanation for something good about disadvantaged people. But uh, in most of the research is how do we explain this disadvantage naturally? And then biotech and pharmaceutical companies are producing race-specific biological remedies for these supposedly naturally created problems that uh, disadvantaged groups have. Now, I'll, I'll go over this rather quickly, but I want to point out that uh, the, this idea that human beings naturally evolved into separate races, which is very, sounds so similar to the idea that God created the races separate, to be separate. Uh, is being circulated in popular 
media, and also in scientific journals. So Nicholas Wade went on to write a really outrageous book called The Troublesome Inheritance, where he argues that there are three principal races, Europeans, blacks, and Asians, and they uh, evolved separately on separate continents, uh, even though Europe and Asia are actually one land mass. But anyway, we'll leave that aside. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, uh, and he says, ever since the first, though, uh, actually, I don't think the races are evolving separately, even today, even if, you know, so there's lots of problems with this. But um, he argues in his book that the races evolved not only to be different physically, but also to have different values and therefore to create different institutions and that white people are peaceful and uh, <laughs> are peaceful and creative. And so they evolved to create democratic institutions and Asians are conformists, so they evolved to create autocratic institutions, and Africans are just prone to violence and tribalism, so they evolve to create no institutions at all. They're just violent. And you might say, well, what about slavery and colonialism and all of that? And he said, well, actually, the Europeans tried to bring democracy to Africa, but the Africans, right. because they were so predisposed to violence, could not adapt to democracy. That's what he writes about. This book was a bestseller when it first came out. So you might say, oh, that's, well, what is, these ideas are outrageous, but this notion that races are populations that uh, differ based in their genes due to evolutionary pressure is very common in scientific literature. Very common, because race is still used as a biological variable in lots and lots of scientific research. And usually the scientists don't even bother to define what they mean by race. But if they're pushed to say, well, what are you talking about? How do you identify these groups? How do you identify the participants, research participants, and to put into the different groups? What's it, why have you said there's three groups, or four groups, or five groups? You know, why not 20? Why not 100? You ask them, and they'll come up with an explanation like this. It's just the way evolution created human beings into these divisions. Uh, and actually, this uh, research study found that after the human genome was mapped, there was an increase. <coughs> this is around, at first there was a little dip in, uh, they're calling it racial realist, but that's biological concepts of race in uh, scientific journals. A uh, little dip, and then there was a skyrocketing of the use of race as a biological category in scientific research. Very uh, surprising, perhaps, given the, all the scientific research we have that the human species is not divided into biological races. Uh, so let me just look at one. Uh, other really horrific gap in health uh, along racial lines in the United States, and that's the fact that black women are three to four times more likely than white women to die from pregnancy-related causes. And this also uh, shows that the uh, mortality rate, maternal mortality rate, is increasing in the United States, uh, unlike any other developed nation in the world but also unlike most developing nations. It's this really incredible. In the Mississippi Delta, it's deadlier for a black woman to give birth than in Rwanda or Kenya. I, the rates are astronomical, astronomical. So why, why is this? Well, some researchers believe that there's something innate in black women that predisposes them to uh, death or predisposes their children to prematurity and uh, infant mortality. And here's just one example of a study that wants to show that there's a genetic difference between black women and white women, and that explains extreme uh, preterm birth. And look at the hypothesis. 
black race, independent of other factors, increases the risk of extreme preterm birth and its frequency of recurrence. What is black race? And what is black race independent of other factors? It's almost like there's an essence of blackness that causes premature, you know, what does that even mean? How do, and, and any researcher in, in the room could see that there's really, it's really gonna be hard to prove this hypothesis because they would have to control for every factor that could possibly increase preterm birth among black women in the United States. Uh, do you think they did that? No, they, they picked a few factors having to do with access to healthcare and uh, WIC and Medicaid receipt, and that they didn't look at, you know, we could, this was a class, I said, can you think of something else? Can I think everybody in this room could think of another factor? But they didn't control for it, and then they just leap to the conclusion that it's genes. And they get a headline in the New York Times, which leads people to read this and think, oh, some researchers actually found that genes explain why black women have higher rates of preterm birth, when they didn't find it at all. They, they didn't prove it whatsoever. Uh, and yet, this kind of research gets published in scientific journals and perpetuates the false view that it's something innate in black people that produces these poor health outcomes rather than all the independent <laughs> social factors that they didn't bother to even consider. Uh, some I've already mentioned some of the problems, but there's a confusion between genetic and sociopolitical categories. Uh, you can't say that these groups are genetically distinct from each other when you're talking about social groups. And you haven't, those researchers didn't even look at genes at all. Uh, they just assumed that there was an identifiable, a biologically identifiable group of people called the black race, and that uh, they could identify who these people were in their research study, uh, when actually, usually, they're talking about some social category. Many use, for example, the Office of Management and Budget, uh, its uh, categories, which are the census categories, they change every time there's a census, they change. They're clearly social categories. The government says these are social categories. And yet many, many researchers use them. Most researchers funded by NIH uh, use them. NIH uses them because there's a federal law that says you've got to use these categories. So um, these ideas end up supporting major decisions uh, like approving a drug for marketing based on race. Uh, the FDA then, I think, added insult to injury by saying that this was a step toward the promise of personalized medicine, reinforcing the view that your race is your biological makeup, uh, and that if doctors and pharmaceutical companies and biomedical researchers focus on race, they're moving toward indiv more individualized treatment. Uh, I, I just feel exactly the opposite. I feel that if you treat me based on my race, you're moving away from individualized treatment because race is being used as a proxy for something else, something else that's important about me. And I want you to look at what that is. If that's important to my health, look at that. If that's important to figuring out what illness I have or how to treat me, what to, medication to prescribe, look at that something else. Don't use race as a proxy for it. Look at what's important. And as I've shown, focusing on race can actually overwhelm those more important factors. 
and end up with a misdiagnosis. So this is something that we've known for a long time. The idea that race is a biological category that causes gaps in health, racial gaps in health, W.E.B. Du Bois challenged that dominant view in 1899 uh, when he wrote The Philadelphia Negro, and he challenged the view that most researchers had at that time that the reason why emancipated African Americans' health was so bad was either because they were naturally incapable of adjusting to freedom or that they had naturally defective bodies that made them susceptible to diseases like tuberculosis. And he pointed out that that claim is a claim about disadvantaged people, that it ignores the social conditions that create it and place it on uh, internal features. And uh, he says with his great sense of humor, perhaps, that it was the Irish were thought <laughs> to also be doomed, naturally predisposed to consumption, but that's when they were unpopular. <laughs> Brings in the politics of it as well. Uh, other researchers have found that the gaps in infant mortality and uh, premature birth uh, cannot be explained by genetic mechanisms and are much better explained by the cumulative effects of inferior social conditions, environmental conditions, uh, environmental toxins, uh, lack of access to high quality health care, the very stress of racism throughout the entire course of black people's lives. And let's not forget inferior care. I, I usually focus on structural barriers to good health, but we also need to recognize, whether it's because of their poverty or because of racial stereotypes, that many black people in this country get inferior care. Uh, and this was from a study looking at the high rate of maternal mortality among black women and interviewing women in the South who had uh, been recently been in labor. And this woman, Tiffany, ja uh, Tiffany in Jackson, Mississippi, uh, describes how women were lined up in the basement of a hospital uh, with very little care giving birth um, and how horrifying it was. Uh, just in November, an op-ed piece in the New York Times really hit the nail on the head when it says, we're sick of racism, <laughs> literally. Uh, they, uh, pointing out all the studies coming out now that are finding that the stress of experiencing racism has bad effects on people's health. This is something that researchers didn't take into account at all. Uh, say a decade ago, and yet we're jumping to the conclusion that it must be genetics. So the way I like to uh, state the impact of racism on health and, and the significance of race in health inequities is that race isn't a biological category that naturally produces health disparities because of genetic differences, but it is a real political category. I'm not saying don't pay attention to race, but pay attention to what race really is. It's a political category that does have biological consequences, but that's because of the social impact uh, on people's health. Race has social consequences that have differing impacts depending on your status in this society on health. So I, I'm going to conclude with some ideas about how
people in the medical profession and, and students can think about, well, how do I practice medicine then? And one of the ideas that's uh, circulating now, uh, primarily uh, because of the work of Jonathan Metzel at Vanderbilt and Helena Hansen at NYU, is the idea of structural competency. Uh, for a long time, the way that medical schools have addressed the idea of race is to teach students cultural competency, to take into account the culture of their patients and adjust their uh, interaction with the patient accordingly. Uh, you have to be really careful when you do that that you're not teaching students stereotypes about people <laughs> of different groups. And also, sort of punting the question about structural inequality and instead focusing on differences in culture when it's actually something more, more of a barrier to actually uh, achieving good health not because of cultural difference, but because they're structural impediments to good health. And so a structural competency asks for us to think about how we might treat patients by taking into account the systems and the structures and the institutions that affect their health. Uh, I co-authored an article uh, with Jonathan Metzl, where we specifically focused on racism in uh, structures and how that affects the practice of medicine and how a structural competency approach might help us address the impact of racism uh, on patients. And we, whoops, sorry, we, uh, oh, here we go. We gave some suggestions at the end. You know, it, we don't, this is a pretty new concept, so we have to work through it. We have to think about it. It's, there's no easy list. So here's what you do to be structurally competent. Uh, it, this takes work. But just some general ideas that we proposed were to learn from disciplines outside of medicine uh, about structural racism. Uh, I, I find that a lot of my students who are undergrads are on a track to go to medical school, and so they take STEM courses. And they may never take a course that addresses structural racism. Fortunately, I have lots of them in my class. My, I teach a course on race, science, and justice. Uh, but many of them will say, I'm. I'm not learning this in my other classes. Uh, it doesn't come up. So there are many medical students who haven't <coughs> learned what structural racism is. I've had students who say, I've never thought about what race is, period. You know, these are graduate students or law students. It's the first time I ever thought what race means. So if you've never even thought about it, how are you going to learn how racism affects patients' health? Well, you've got to reach out to other disciplines as well. Uh, draw lessons from other professions. Uh, the social work profession, for example, has had a history of paying attention to structural inequalities in society. Are there ways in which they do it? Can, can uh, this is uh, my next suggestion, can doctors collaborate with social workers and lawyers and sociologists uh, and others to address structural problems? Because uh, I know many times doctors and students will say, well, I, you know, I just have a little time to treat a patient in my clinic. Uh, how am I supposed to address all of this? Well, one way is to collaborate with other people who are also trying to address it, and each one does his or her part, and then uh, you figure out how to integrate these efforts in a way that better treats patients by taking structural inequality into account. And then a fourth thing is to speak up more vocally about structural issues that impact patients. So maybe 
as a medical student or a doctor or someone in uh, public health, uh, you're not able to address uh, mass incarceration, which, I mean, think about the impact of that on black people's health. Uh, or the health of anyone who's incarcerated. Just mass incarceration affecting health in the United States. We have the highest prison population of any place in the world and ever in the history of Western democracies. Uh, too little research has been done on that. I, I'm always amazed at research that looks for genetic explanations for racial gaps in health, but we haven't even looked at what's the impact of growing up in a neighborhood where your chances of going to jail are 50-50, and you are stopped by the police every time you leave your house. Yeah, that's traumatic. I'm sure many of us have. If you haven't been stopped by the police, you've had a siren come up behind you. It's traumatic, uh, let alone being put in jail and not having money for, you know, I could go on and on. Just think of the health implication. Okay, maybe as a doctor, you don't, have the time or the know-how to address it, but you know what? You can support bail funds that uh, are giving money to people to get out of jail. You can support a movement to end mass incarceration or even abolish prisons. Uh, you can certainly support universal health care. You know, people will listen to doctors and medical students, right, and support universal health care. So there's Lots of ways that even if you yourself can't directly change that aspect of a patient's life, you can work with others to change the structures and the systems. You know, pa doctors have money and authority and respect uh, in this country, and their voices make a difference. So that's, that's another way. And so I will just close on this note that we have known for a long, long time that people's social status affects their health. I mean, th there's just so much evidence of that that's been proven for, you know, W.E.B. Du Bois proved it in 1899. Uh, and there's been more and more evidence to show that. We know that countries that are more equal have the healthiest people. We know that. Uh, and so why do we persist in looking for biological genetic explanations for social inequality when we know how social inequality is produced? And so in whatever way we can, the best thing we can do to improve the health of people in the United States is to affirm our common humanity by ending the social inequities that actually divide us. And a more <coughs> just society would be healthier for everybody, for everybody. So thank you so much. <laughs> I think it's the mic for the, yeah, the mic is coming. <laughs> You're upstairs, so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. The genetics drives everything. Yeah. Billions of dollars on genome-wide yeah. uh, studies for diseases. Yeah. Racism is at the center, and white supremacy is at the center of how science gets done, and it is also at the center of how doctors and scientists are trained. Mm -hmm. Do we have any potential suggestions? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay, that's true. And you know, it, so much so.
that what you just said, many people say, oh, you can't say that. And it's so interesting because people like, people like Nicholas Wade and others will say, oh, uh, it's taboo in this country, Sally Sigal, taboo to argue that race is biological and there are genetic reasons for these differences. That's absurd. It's not taboo, as you said. There's probably billions now of dollars spent looking for those genetic causes, and they haven't helped to reduce health inequities in this country at all, at all. But you're not supposed to even challenge that. That's what's taboo, is to challenge that, to just say, basically, look, we can see how race and racism has traveled from the time of slavery to today, sometimes directly, directly, and how it continues to influence <coughs> medical practice and medical research. These, just this, these basic concepts that have not been shaken, that people hold on to. So one aspect of it is, uh, which is why I've, you know, I've written about lots of different things involving injustice, and recently, uh, when I wrote my book, was the fundamental ideology behind it all is this idea that human beings are naturally divided into biological races, and that explains inequality. That fundamental idea that comes from 17th century still is so ingrained in U.S. culture. I mean, it's global now, global. But Let's focus on the U.S. It's so ingrained in U.S. culture, the way children are raised, in what they're taught, what textbooks say, where research money is spent. Uh, and so one thing we have to do is to continue to challenge that basic concept. Uh, I find that people are, many people, are so shaken by the idea that race isn't natural, they can't even, they can't wrap their heads around it. They would, they don't know how to engage with other human beings without assuming that because of that person's race, they're naturally a certain way. <coughs> they, they can't imagine how you could possibly practice medicine or do research into health inequities or just health period <laughs> without dividing research subjects or patients by race. They, they don't want to even imagine it. And I think that many people have a deep, deep, deep investment in holding on to the idea that we can understand the world by dividing people into races. Uh, many people don't want to face the reality that America is founded in racism and white supremacy, and it's built into every institution in this nation, and that people's health, whether they end up in jail or not, whether they graduate from college, whether they have a big bank account, whether they have an inheritance, all of that is affected by structural racism. It just, sh it shakes people to the core to have to think otherwise. I, as I was working on my book, I thought, this is what it's like, I think, for someone who <coughs> believes deeply in God to be told, stop believing in God. You know, they just can't do it. I couldn't do it. I'll admit that <laughs> I believe in God. I could not, not believe in God. I like the idea bothers me. I mean, I think of anything else that, you know, I, but I think a deep religious belief is the most akin, maybe even the belief in race is even deeper than that. Because people don't even want to convert from <laughs> believing in race. They, so that's one thing. We have to, we have to start imagining what it would mean not to divide human beings by race. Now, having said that, I am not, we live in a world where human beings are divided by race. And it affects every aspect of our lives. So 
we also have to challenge the view that we shouldn't talk about race and racism. We shouldn't confront people about it. We shouldn't uh, deal with it at all. We should pretend that either there's no racism or that if we talk about it, somehow it's going to <coughs> expand. Uh, that clearly has not worked. And so we need more and more forums, and I mean forums spread across you know, from elementary school education to churches to higher education to the media, you know, that grapples with yes. this horror of continued structural racism in the United States and the devastation that it's causing. Just to confront that, it, the, the U.S. now, it stands out as a country that has you know, astounding statistics, like the maternal mortality rate going up, like having the highest prison rate of any nation in history and now. You know, the, the prison rate of black people in America, I'm talking about just the general prison rate, the prison rate of black people in America, it's, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. And people, whole communities are being excluded from society and harmed in horrible ways just because of race or because of poverty. So, so those are sort of the education, you know, cultural kinds of things that are really important. And, uh, and then more and more people have to be willing to speak out against it, to challenge it. You know, people who are peer reviewing journals question hypotheses like the one I showed. Uh, people who are peer reviewing grants, research grants, question it. Uh, there, there is a, an apathy uh, about the continuation of these false ideas in science and medicine. Uh, it's very strange. It's very strange because we're talking about people who dedicate their career to improving health or to advancing knowledge. And yet when it comes to race, they're willing to rely on what European type, you know, Blumenbach, they're using the same typologies, the same ideas, even prior to that. This is pre-modern science. <laughs> it really is. It's pre-enlightenment, the enlightenment took this idea that human beings were divided into these categories and ex incorporated it into the Enlightenment. And we're talking about you know, like really backward thinking that modern day scientists are using. And people are, I, I don't, there's a, an unwillingness to say anything among many people against scientists. Now I can understand why, because we are in a culture war against scientists. You know, we've got an administration that is kicking scientists out of uh, its, its uh, agencies uh, and is calling scientific facts false facts. You know, so we, I mean, we clearly we're in an age where we have to support uh, scientific investigation. But that doesn't mean that we should not criticize and call for an end of dangerous and backward ideas within science. But there's a, so there's, there's this contradiction that it's the progressive liberal people <laughs> who don't want to criticize science because they see it as uh, necessary to 
support scientists because it's the right wing conservatives who are opposing science. Uh, but you know, let's remember eugenics was a progressive science. You know, we have to, as progressive people who care about humanity and equality and justice, we have to be willing to say what you said. But they're not, I mean, you're an exception. No, you are. If we think about all that's in US culture now, in the media, in journals, in education, most people will not stand up and say that a whole lot of research done in the United States by supposedly liberal people who want to help humanity has racism in the very conception of what they're doing. And so we need to be willing to say this has to change. This has to change and to cross certain boundaries, like disciplinary boundaries. Uh, to cross boundaries between the academy and communities. So that people who are willing to stand up and challenge racism in all its forms, even if it's in a liberal institution, <laughs> people who are willing to do that come together to make a change. But if, we're, if we won't, if we're afraid, you know, if we're afraid to do it, we're in big trouble because the people who are willing to come out and say there's a superior white race, they're more vocal than ever before. They're more vocal than ever before. And guess what? Go on there if you want to look. Look at their websites. They're citing the very kinds of scientific studies I've been talking about. So who is going to? Who's going to stand up to criticize and change this notion of biological race? So that's another, I mean, I know I'm talking sort of generally, but all of these pieces are, are necessary in order to, to make a change. Mm hmm thanks. Thanks for your statement and your question. Well, it's seven, a little after seven, and uh, we do have a book signing that will happen all. Oh, okay, outside. okay, that's right. I want right. to thank everybody. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much.